that's okay. Just letting you know in case uh, someone is not comfortable with recording, they can let me know and um, we can figure something out. All right. Thank you, Husta, for the thumbs up. Very cool. <clears throat> if anybody finds recording challenging, make sure that your camera is off. Mm -hmm. So I think we have 81 registrations, we had 81 registrations, just waiting for people to join for a few more minutes, maybe two or three minutes. And then um, Ozma, our host, will start the program formally. I hope everybody is okay to wait for another couple of minutes. People are still joining. Okay. Should we start? Usma, Wazia. We will always wait for the boss, Sara. Yes. Um, the boss, Usma. I think can we start? <laughs> okay, start. Yeah, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. We are still expecting few people to join us. And in the meanwhile, we'll start. I know everyone and along with us, everybody's excited to know what is this report about. And uh, I would start to invite Sara to acknowledge the land. Sara, over to you, please. Thank you so much. So the Coalition of Muslim Women acknowledges that um, our um, office, which is uh, in my house where I stand in the office that we are situated in uh, the family center, we are on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, uh, Haudenosaunee and the neutral people. Um, and uh, we are situated on the Haldeman track, which, uh, which was land promised to six nations, which includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. And I hope that we um, take time to not just, you know, have say these words, but to um, really understand um, our commitment to reconciliation and, um, um, and and that work as well. So um, may, let's, if we, we could all take a couple of um, seconds to think about that, please. Thank you. 
Thank you, Saya. And now I would like to invite Fazia Mazar. Many of you know Fazia, and probably you know us as a staff, but Fazia is the executive director of Coalition of Muslim Women. Fazia, would you please like to share something about this report as an opening remark? Thank you, Uzma. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us to hear about um, some of the highlights of the reports that you will be um, that will be presented by our consulting firm, uh, Common Cost Consulting, um, in a few minutes. My job is to welcome you all and kind of give you a little bit of background, the story about why we decided to do um, uh, this. Uh, uh, needs assessment for Muslim women in Waterloo region. So for those of you who may be new to the coalition, let me just give you a brief um, overview of who we are. Um, so this organization was founded by a handful of women in 2010. And basically we're now a charitable organization. It's quite a new thing that happened in February. So we're quite proud of it. Our mandate is to empower Muslim women and girls to be leaders and change makers. And how we do it? We do it by providing opportunities for personal and pro professional growth and leadership and skills development while addressing issues of gender-based violence, racism, discrimination, and Islamophobia through advocacy, activism, and a bridge building. So as you can see that um, anything of concern to Muslim women is what is um, an issue of concern for the organization. Um, we've been around for over 10 years now and uh, most, mostly like, you know, the focus of our work for most of that time was external. So really looking at the violence in the community and how it impacts Muslim women from hate crime, hate incidents, to Islamophobia and a lot of other things. However, throughout that time, we always heard from women who were involved with the organization as members, as volunteers, um, to also look at violence that happened within families, for example, and, uh, and uh, within the, the communities um, that you belong, belong to in terms of faith communities and cultural communities. With COVID, that need became, um, really like you know that need became urgent almost when we hear about you know how uh, when not just like you know you see the statistics coming out you, you hear the stories and you know that all of the uh, uh, the, the uh, you know stressors because of covid are also putting families more at risk of violence at home so during that time um uh, we were able to get uh, some funding from uh, the COVID funding through Canadian Red Cross, Government of Canada, to run a program called Keeping Families Safe During Pandemic, really like, you know, is starting to hit uh, the, 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 the challenge of violence within families um, mm -hmm. a little bit, like, you know, talking about it. During that time, I'm not gonna give you a lot of details. Visam is going to talk more about that. But during that time, what we learned was a really like, you know, a gap between women, um, racialized women, including Muslim women and the service providers in terms of really knowing what their needs are. And that gave birth to this idea of, we so we as an organization, a small organization, we're not able to provide, we're not able to provide solutions to every challenge that you know, in our case, racialized women are facing. As we have heard about this saying that, you know, we need a village to raise a child. We also need the village uh, to, to bring solutions to those uh, challenges and problems that our communities are facing. So with that in mind, um, we wanted to do something where Muslim women can be uh, like, you know, contacted and, you know, ask, ask uh, questions from them about what is missing, what's happening, what's their knowledge of, you know, the, the services and programs available in the community in general, like, you know, just, just conducting a needs assessment of Muslim women in Waterloo region, which we couldn't find any precedents, like, you know, there wasn't anything that was done, anything, something which was the closest was a Spanish community, uh, needs assessment that was done, I think about 15 years ago, but other than that, we couldn't really find anything uh, that could help. 
So with that idea in mind, we saw the need as urgent and we really wanted to do something. And that's where the Women and Department of Women and Gender Equality came into the picture. Thank you, Janet, you are here. You're the one who I reached out to. Um, so we reached out to with this proposal to Department of Women and Gender Equality uh, for support to conduct a needs assessment for Muslim women in Waterloo region. And we were very fortunate that our proposal was accepted. Thank you again, Janet. I know you put some good words for us. So that's really great. And uh, um, we had Common Cause Consulting hired uh, to do this work. It was very intense work for our staff team for a couple of months. It was really hard to focus on anything else. It's just like meetings, meetings, meetings. The timing was very important. We had to finish it by March 31st, but it was an amazing experience that happened um, uh, during that time. And I'm very, very happy to share with you that initially we our target was to reach out to 100 women. And okay, I'll keep that as a surprise. So just wait until we hear the report that how many women we were able to actually include in that study. Um, uh, and I will not give you a lot of details about the study because of course you're going to hear um, about these things from the, uh, from the researchers. But I can tell you that as a person who is immersed in this work, um, I still found a lot of surprises, a lot of new things that I learned. And, uh, uh, and I cannot uh, thank enough to, uh, I cannot thank, um, I cannot like, you know, I really am very thankful to Cameron and Lindsay and you'll hear um, from them later on about the work that they did. And thank you to all of the staff that was uh, involved with that including our amazing peer workers. Without their help, we could have not done anything. So without further ado, again, a, a really heartfelt thank, thanks to our funder, to our researchers, to the staff, especially the peer workers. We are here today to uh, listen to the voices of a very large number of women from our region. And these are the voices that are not always present on our decision-making tables, on our planning tables. So it's really a great opportunity for all of us to hear these women kind of speak in the results of um, uh, this study. Thank you, Uzma. Thank, Thank you, Fosia. Uh, I couldn't agree with you that new surprises came up and what we expected, things came out to be slightly different as well. Um, and uh, Cameron and Lindsay, I hope and we hope that we didn't torture you for the report. Uh, thank you for all the cooperation. Uh, now I would like to invite Wissam. Wissam is our staff member. She is coordinator for Toward Violence-Free Homes. She's going to talk about how she worked with the peers, what were the outcomes, and after that she's going to talk about Toward Violence-Free Home, which is our project. Wissam, over to you. Hello everyone, assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. I can't thank you enough for uh, joining us uh, this evening uh, in this event. I'm gonna share my screen with a very short, hopefully <laughs> short presentation. I don't wanna bore you or like take the lights from our uh, Cameron and Lindsay today. So I'm just trying to share and I should be able to start the show. Yeah. Is it okay there? Like, can you see everything good? Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll be talking later on about the Toward Violence Free Homes program that's uh, I'm the coordinator for. But first I would like, um, uh, I would like to talk about the role, the great, the key role or the great role of the um, uh, community peer workers team. Sorry, there's a mistake here. Community peer workers team throughout all the projects uh, in this uh, uh, program. First was the keeping your family safe during the pandemic and then through this need assessment and uh, eventually now uh, toward violence-free homes uh, program. So, um, yeah. Um, so, uh, CMW Community Peer Workers Team. 
came together in September 2020. As you may know, and as, as Hosea mentioned earlier, during the pandemic, the number of domestic violence cases increased. Due, of course, to the lockdown, the stress and isolation, and many other factors. At CMW, we wanted to do our part in raising awareness about this issue within our Muslim community. The idea was to recruit a team of Muslim women who are active in their communities to lead community sessions around issues that can cause family stress or domestic violence and provide the resources available in the community. In less than two weeks, we managed to recruit 10 women from diverse backgrounds who are ready to receive a training around different topics such as stress management or anger management, healthy relationship, and hold kind of a community discussion around it and sharing their experience and then talk about the resources in the community and how to reach out to it. Um, those sessions were in, uh, um, uh, those sessions were provided in English for the West African Muslim communities who speaks only English, uh, that was Fadila, our peer. I hope that she's here today. Uh, and also we provided uh, information in Amharic Tigrania for the Ethiopian Eritrean community and that was in Good morning, Mitzi. And uh, we provided those information in Arabic as well through three community peer workers and that was due to the diversity of the Arabic speaker in the, in the community. So we had uh, um, Ausaf who uh, uh, provided information for the Maghreb Arab countries community. We have Rana who uh, communicated with the Middle Eastern countries Arabic speaker community. And we have Um Kalsum who uh, provided information to the Sudanese community. Also, we have the diary uh, um, uh, information that was provided by Maryam uh, uh, to the Afghan community at that time, and then Farisi that was provided by Sepida, um, our community we work at that time, uh, worked with the Iranian community, and we had uh, Hindi, Urdu, Punjabi, our community uh, peer worker uh, who provided it to the South uh, Asian community. And we had Rahma Omar, uh, who will provide information to Somali community and uh, seminar for the Turkish um, uh, community. Uh, those amazing team managed to um, uh, reach out to 792 community members. Those, this number, they all participated on those sessions uh, in different way in person uh, as group session that was late September, then the restriction was that wasn't that hard as today. We still had that opening of, uh, I think, indoor uh, group uh, of 10, not more than 10, and then outside, I think, not more than uh, 25 at that time. And, uh, but then after the lockdown, we carried on through the Zoom sessions and phone calls and also the WhatsApp. So um, I, mentioned, I mentioned the name of the peers at that uh, project because I think may, many of them are attending today. So I really thank them for the hard work they did. Oops. Uh, the, the feedback that we got from the peers at that time through the, those sessions, that there is a lack of information about the community resources available or misunderstanding about who or when to reach out to those resources available. Uh, that's why CMW proceeds to the next stage of the program and run the need assessment uh, to have an evidence-based report. Of course, we are all today to know about the uh, details about this report. And this is what Cameron and Lindsay are gonna uh, uh, provide us in a minute. You're not out of the hook of my <laughs> presentation yet. So uh, talking about the next stage, uh, they need the, the role of uh, um, uh, the uh, peers uh, worker within the uh, Muslim um, uh, women's need assessment. The team role was to give the opportunity for the group of women who will not be able to fill the online survey by themselves due to a language barrier or do uh, or they don't or maybe they don't have enough knowledge or access to technology 
or any reason that prevent them from participating. In order to reach out to as many women as possible, uh, the team um, was expanded a little bit. So we added to the previous team, a Gujarati uh, is um, a, community peer, uh, a community peer worker who speaks Gujarati, who communicated with uh, the um, uh, Gujarati community, which is uh, Fatima, and also uh, the Pushto uh, uh, community, which is Malka, a Rohingya community, with uh, Roma Roma. Sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Zoom bombing. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So, uh, yeah, and Rohingya community, our community peer worker at that time uh, was Roma Roma. Uh, also, we have Khatira who joined us as the uh, community peer worker for the Afghani um, uh, community in the state of uh, Maryam who couldn't uh, continue with us. And also, we have um, another here who uh, joined us uh, for, I was saying, I'm sorry, I just lost my thoughts. <laughs> um, Sadia, who joined us for uh, the South Asian community to communicate with the South Asian community through Hindi, Urdu, Punjabi uh, for the needs and support. Um, okay. Okay, so, um, as you will see in the report, the team did a great job in reaching out to the targeted group and arranged for some community focus groups that we learned a lot from, especially when it came to domestic violence issue. With all the knowledge and recommendation uh, by the community from the first project and the need assessment, uh, the third part of the project is started, which is the uh, towards violence uh, free homes. I just wanted to mention that Semen also joined us as a team for the um, uh, for the uh, Iranian uh, community. Okay, uh, so for toward violence free homes uh, uh, program, the community peer workers team will have a key again and again. I can't really press that uh, much. Their their key role. Uh, in the program that they will play as a provincial uh, role, role to raising awareness in their community by organizing and leading by weekly sessions to strengthen their relationship with their communities and build a safe space for uh, racialized women, including Muslim women. Um, uh, I mean here, like it's it's not only for Muslim women, it's like anyone can join uh, uh, those sessions or uh, benefit from the services that will be provided uh, by, this, uh, by this project. To share their thoughts and learn about the community resources available. And they will also play, uh, the, the peers will also play an inter intervention role by connecting with women at risk or experiencing domestic violence to provide one-on-one -on -one support to navigate their options and help them to connect with the proper community resources available. In case of more of the support needed and more follow-up needed, uh, um, uh, needed for those uh, women, the peers will connect uh, those women with the project co coordinator, in this case it's me, to provide more of a direct support, such as providing uh, some financial support toward food security, child care, and mental health. I mean by mental health support or um, uh, connecting them with a counselor uh, who speaks their languages or from the same background and kind of uh, contribute uh, financially toward those opportunities. Um, in addition to that, also provide uh, or connect them with some uh, like technology by providing a Chromebooks for them uh, uh, in a way to connect to the technology uh, and um, uh, navigate also the system with the help of the peers if they need it, or provide any kind of support that they might need. Of course, we will not be able to do it without putting uh, all of us to put our hands together to support those women. Support those women. 
And also we won't be able to do it without the general, the, the funder support and the community uh, agencies uh, cooperation. At this stage, toward violence free homes program, uh, the peers are uh, almost done with their training that we're gonna provide them. It's, uh, they are provided with 48 hours of training for now, and it might be up to 60 hours of training um, as needed uh, to empower them to do their roles. Um, the training include uh, different areas. So some of the training included uh, uh, providing them with some uh, professional skills, uh, such as communications, uh, communication skills, professional boundaries, cultural humility. Uh, the trainer also uh, touched on some uh, building knowledge around areas such as understanding oppression, power and privilege, understanding violence in the community and so on. And in addition to that, uh, the training provided some session about secondhand trauma and self-care. Of course, majority of the training is about domestic violence issues such as type, the types, the different types of domestic violence, including gender-based violence and understanding of family violence from Canadian legal perspective. The peers now are planning to start their bi-weekly sessions. Some peers already started their the, the bi-weekly sessions within their communities in their languages. So please, if you know any community member would like to join or you think that they will benefit from connecting with us in these sessions, uh, or they need the uh, support, the direct support or one-on-one -on -one support in, in, in some situation of domestic violence, please feel free to connect, uh, contact me. I will leave my email in the chat uh, and uh, I will connect those women with uh, uh, um, our team members. Thank you so much for listening. I'm really not sure if I am over my time, but thank you so much for listening. Thank you. You are not at over at your over, over the time. You are just on time. Thank you. What a great information and what a, a project and work that is needed in the community. Uh, with that, I would like to invite Lindsay and Cameron Diela from Common Cost Consulting to share some some of the things through the summary. And of course, the report will be shared later. But uh, Lindsay and Cameron, thank you so much for. Um, doing this project with us, we really appreciate. Over to you. Great, thank you very much. I'm just going to work on um, getting the uh, the screen sharing going, uh, so we have the presentation up. Um, so, hope everyone's having a great afternoon and everyone is uh, staying safe and healthy and um, and well on this uh, this beautiful day. And there we go. Um, so, uh, just confirming, you do see a slide, right? That's uh, great. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I want to make sure. Uh, so uh, as, uh, as mentioned, my name is Cameron Dearlove and uh, with, with Lindsay Butcher, um, we, were, uh, we were contracted to work on, on this report. Uh, it's called Creating Equitable Services for Muslim Women in Waterloo Region. Uh, and as you can see, the date, April 2021. 20, uh, uh, so after this meeting, I think you can go to the coalition's website into the report section and you can download uh, either the summary report, but you probably want to get the full report because uh, uh, you'll want all nearly 70 pages of, of content in it. Um, this was, uh, you know, truly a, um, an amazing project to work on. Um, it's, it's one of those ones where, you know, when you, you finish, you, you feel like it was a real privilege to be a part of um, really getting, um, you know, the amount of, you know, both the amount of information uh, to, to work through, but also, you know, the uh, you know, very personal and, um, and, and amazing stories and ideas and contributions from uh, so many people. It's, uh, it's been truly a pleasure. Um, so just a few uh, acknowledgements here. Uh, so as mentioned, um, Lindsay and I uh, were both the authors on the report. Um, the research advisory committee was um, made up of uh, Fazia, Sara, Usman, and Wassam from the Coalition of Muslim Women. And uh, and, and no, you didn't annoy us at all. And uh, we, we uh, assume that we probably did on the other end, <laughs> but uh, uh, a great, uh, great group to work with. Um, and we also want to um, share a thanks with uh, Aisha Gul, uh, who um, she sat in on, on so many of the, um, 
the meetings and the focus groups and, and transcribed for us. Um, and so did a wonderful job there. Um, the CMW's team of peer support workers, um, so who Wissam was just talking about, uh, they were such stars in this, uh, in this journey, um, you know, without them, we would have had about, uh, you know, probably less than half of the, of the information and the data that we, we ended up with. Um, and, and, you know, really it's, it's their work that, um, that made so much of, uh, of what we were able to experience and, and bring in possible. And then, um, it, you know, Fazia mentioned uh, that we were hoping to connect with a hundred uh, Muslim women in the community. Um, you know, maybe since uh, they're a charitable organization now, we should have done some sort of a um, some sort of a raffle or an over under or something like that uh, to to raise money. But uh, the the total we ended up with uh, 570 uh, Muslim women living in Waterloo Region who contributed either through the surveys or in our focus groups and interviews, and then added to that um, uh, for more than 40. Uh, nonprofit organizations who responded to our, our surveys and, and participated in interviews. So in total, over 600 um, uh, people who uh, people in groups who contributed uh, to the information and the data in this report. Um, just uh, just an absolutely remarkable um, response to it, and and everybody the the energy behind it was um, was really amazing to see because I think there were so many people that were just excited to be able to share their, their voices and get asked questions that they, they often don't get asked and, and to think about things that, um, that, uh, that many people don't, don't think about as often. And uh, so it was really just a, a great experience. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the generous support of the Department of Women and Gender Equality, the Government of Canada who funded this project. Um, we definitely thank you. It was, uh, as mentioned, it's real, been a real privilege. Okay. So, um, hi everyone, my name is Lindsay. Um, I'll be sharing the presenting duties along with Cameron. So the purpose of our study, um, just quickly, was to give voice to Muslim women in Waterloo Region and allowing them to sort of speak to service providers about their experiences, their hopes and their needs. And as Fazia mentioned um, in her opening remarks, the, the goal was not um, for the coalition to do a needs assessment, to look at all the projects they themselves would have to create, but really to provide the information and the data to the community, to other service providers to help them to improve uh, their services and their service offerings. Next slide. Cameron, you have to. <laughs> There we go. So here is a bit of our methodology. So as alluded to earlier, um, we did use a mixed methods approach. We had an online survey that was uh, filled out by uh, 226 Muslim women. And then we had um, some support from the team of peer support workers who, phone, who did surveys over the phone with 249 uh, Muslim women, and most of this group uh, were more isolated. Many of them could not speak English. Um, they were newer to Canada, and so it was quite an isolated group. But it was our target area, our target group that we really wanted to make sure that their voices were heard. Um, and so the peer support workers did those surveys with them over the phone. We also conducted ten focus groups, most of them in uh, languages other than English. Uh, to make sure that we had a good representation of the community because the community of Muslim women in Waterloo Region is quite diverse. We also did um, a survey with service providers as well as interviews with service providers. And then of course, looking at uh, local data and our research statistics. Uh, the peer support workers, they were provided with training on how to deliver the survey as well as supports um, on how to handle any traumatic disclosures that may come up um, when they're filling out the surveys uh, with our participants. So the report um, that you can find on the coalition's website um, contains an executive summary. It outlines uh, in a bit more detail our research methods. It goes into the sample, uh, the demographics of the sample that's contained within the survey. And then it focuses on each of our theme areas. And so we have sections on employment, on youth and young people, community harm and hate crimes, family harm, which is like domestic violence, mental health and financial independence. 
And then we've also broken out the data for uh, nine of the cultural and language groups. There were more than uh, these nine language groups represented within the sample, but these samples uh, were large enough, large enough for us to do um, an actual kind of data analysis with the samples. So we have um, data from the African community, Arabic speaking, Ethiopian and Eritrean communities, Gujarati, Iranian community, Pashto, Somali, Turkish, Urdu, and Hindi. And of course, many of these identities overlap and intersect. So where we did have a large enough sample, we were able to break that out, um, but it's also rolled up into the larger groups like African. Um, so that's um, what is also provided. So within the report, if you're looking for you know, a specific um, needs assessment for you know, the Somali community of women, um, there is that breakout data available. Um, we also have findings from the service providers and then 35 detailed recommendations. And Cameron and I are gonna go over just a highlight of these recommendations, but the detailed recommendations are contained within the full report. We also have a summary report because our report is quite long. So if you only wanna look at sort of the executive summary that is also available for download. You definitely want the full report, I'll, I'll say. Um, you know, one of the things about the full report um, is, is you know, the, you, you sort of see the scale of the response uh, that we received. And and one of the things that we wanted to, to highlight, you know, again, going back to what a privilege it was to be a, a part of it, you know, especially the focus groups um, that we had where, where um, we got to, you know, spend a few hours um, on, on Zoom calls and, and really get into depth about um, issues and experiences and ideas, um, you know, really um, was an amazing experience and, and, you know, something that I wish everybody could uh, have been able to participate in. <clears throat> but we tried to um, add some of these voices throughout the report. So you'll see that we have um, added some quotes uh, along the way. And, you know, some of them are, are we kind of describe them as gut punches. They're, they're, um, there's such strong um, quotes where you know you you can really get a sense for well, the experience that that person's gone through. So you know, as an example, <clears throat> this interviewee said, "The biggest challenge is the visible challenge: layers of clothing, hijab, and automatically assumptions are made about you that you don't speak English, you're not as educated as them, you don't belong. Once you break that barrier, then you still have the barriers of being a woman, the phobias and preconceived notions of oppression, etc. As a black Muslim." woman, immigrant, now there are four things against me that feed into what people think that I can do, that I can't do. And, you know, just uh, the, the quotes throughout, you'll, you'll hear, um, yeah, ideas and concepts that, um, that just are so important to be conveyed. And, and we hope that uh, we've been able to do that in the report. Um, as Lindsay mentioned, uh, this, uh, this presentation, we're not getting into you know, all of our findings and, and we don't even have time to get into all of the recommendations. The recommendations that we made are, are coming from um, different concepts or different challenges or different ideas that we heard, um, whether it's from the, you know, the 570 uh, women who participated in, in the survey, um, along with um, the 40 plus nonprofit organizations that, uh, that we heard from. And we tried to um, boil some of that down into you know, easy or uh, simple to understand recommendations that go out to the community. They're, they're sort of being sent out in the community and, and we hope that um, they become useful in, in your work. So we'll, we'll, start, we'll go over the different um, themes of the recommendations that, uh, that we covered. The, the first area, this is just sort of general um, areas that, uh, uh, that we have recommendations. So the first area is, uh, is that mainstream agencies should assess their knowledge and service gaps that may lead to an over-reliance on grassroots racialized, religio-cultural, and or ethno-cultural focused organizations, which is a very long uh, term, easier to, to write than to say. Um, and, and what we mean there is, is that um, there are, you know, a wide number of um, organizations that are out there, you know, particularly the grassroots organizations, usually volunteer driven, um, that are out there doing all kinds of great work in the community. They are a bridge uh, between um, different, uh, different populations in the community and mainstream uh, organizations. And what we heard, you know, both through um, the, the women who participated in the surveys and the focus groups um, was 
you know, one of the areas that we, we, we heard throughout was just how important these groups are. So groups like the Coalition of Muslim Women um, and, and many other organizations, the, the role that they play in their lives is, um, is very powerful. And especially when it comes to accessing services. One of the other um, things that we heard was that um, many mainstream organizations were aware of these organizations, but not necessarily aware of what those organizations do or the role that they play. So perhaps rather than um, thinking about these organizations as being uh, a bridge into service for, uh, for example, for Muslim women, um, they're seeing them as an alternative service. So we maybe don't even need to really serve this person because um, this organization, you know, can serve that population better. And, and what we often heard from, uh, from the, the women themselves was that they want the best service. Uh, but they want to do it in a way that's it's it's comfortable for them and, and welcoming. So the recommendations that we have uh, for mainstream organizations are to conduct research into the frequency and breadth of support requests made to these organizations, provide financial compensation for the expertise of this organization, of these organizations, and work with religious and culturally focused organizations to build a service map to clarify roles and interactions. Uh, because again, what we heard sometimes from service providers was, for example, um, if, as, as an example, um, if somebody was seeking uh, employment support, they, uh, we, we heard sometimes, oh, we would send them to the Coalition of Muslim Women um, who didn't necessarily have an employment program. Um, but the, the, the thing that they, they would hold on to is, well, it's a Muslim woman, so they should go there rather than do they even have the program that would be helpful for this person. The financial compensation piece is, is important too because um, what we were hearing from a lot of the, um, the more grassroots organizations that we connected with was that they were, there was a lot asked of them uh, from mainstream organizations, um, you know, whether it's sitting on committees or you know, working in collaboration around supporting an individual or a family, um, but the mainstream organization might be funded for, for that work, whereas the grassroots organization uh, was not. And so um, they were being asked for their, their expertise and their support in, in the work, um, but those organizations are, are often getting by without, um, uh, without a lot of financial support. So that's something that, you know, as a community, we need to look at, uh, you know, what's the role of uh, all these wonderful grassroots organizations that are doing this great work, uh, and how can we actually support them uh, so that they can do it sustainably? Because what we found was that there were often, you know, one or two people in that organization carrying an immense load for the community. Um, and not receiving uh, the compensation that, uh, that they deserved. Uh, another recommendation that we had was that local funders should consider additional resources to support grassroots racialized, religio-cultural, and our ethno-culturally focused organizations. So again, looking at these organizations and figuring out, um, you know, perhaps they're, they're not able to compete in, in general um, granting opportunities when they're competing with, you know, large multi-million dollar organizations. Um, so what can funders do to make sure that, um, that these organizations are, uh, are um, adequately funded? We also looked at um, just in general access to services. So you can see here we have um, a chart where we, we asked about um, if somebody uh, was trying to access your services, and this is a, a question directed at uh, service providers, um, and that person could not communicate in English, what would your organization do? So we had about um, half of the respondents said that they do have funding for interpretation. Um, a few said that there is no money uh, in the budget to cover it. Uh, some said that um, ask, they would ask a community partner for help. So perhaps they might call someone like the Coalition of Muslim Women and say, you know, can you help with interpretation in this, uh, in this regard? And again, that's a role that the, that, um, that organization might not be funded for. Uh, or they might suggest that they bring a family member or a friend um, or, you know, uh, one or two respondents just didn't have any plans in place uh, for interpretation. So again, you know, bringing a family or uh, a friend, that might be okay in, in some situations. Um, but, you know, if somebody's seeking support for mental health, for example, um, you know, that might not be the, the, right, uh, the right way to do that. So the, um, the recommendations that we had here uh, were that service providers could locate, engage, or partner with faith communities to offer programs that are endorsed by the communities the program aims to serve. Uh, this is something that we heard um, uh, quite a number of times in the, uh, in the focus groups when it came, uh, in, in, in especially in regards to mental health, where um, we heard throughout the focus groups, you know, a lot of um, 
uh, resistance or concern about um, about accessing supports for mental health, uh, about stigma, about um, uh, the community that they might belong to, um, you know, feeling that, um, that that wasn't something that they were comfortable with. And some people would say, you know, if, if, um, if that service provider was working with the mosque, for example, and it felt like they were endorsed, then, then that's something that uh, then we might go ahead and access that, uh, that service. So it's something to, um, to consider as far as opening up, um, opening up that access. Uh, the use of peer support workers to engage isolated communities should be continued and expanded. And we talk about this, you know, again, the uh, the, the peer workers that um, that were a part of um, the work that the coalition is doing and a part of the study, um, you know, just an amazing connection. And, um, it, you know, the use of peer workers is something that, uh, you know, I know personally, I I've, I've, um, think has been, I have always thought has been very important. And it wasn't until the study, I saw just how important it was. Um, when sometimes, for example, um, in the um, in the focus groups, you know, we would say, okay, so if if you you know needed to access this kind of support, where would you go to look for it? And you know, the response was typically, um, you know, whoever their peer support worker was. Well, that's who I would go to. That's the person that knows. And so that um, that role, the peer support worker, is um, such an essential uh, bridge and navigator uh, within the community. Another recommendation we had was that a backbone organization should explore increased funding for local interpretation or an umbrella subscription to telephone interpretation services that can be shared with service providers throughout the community. So some, um, some services uh, would have um, funding for interpretation built in. So for example, when it comes to healthcare, uh, domestic violence, uh, we heard that uh, that that would be available, but then in, in a number of other services and in other situations, that's not something that's available. Uh, we heard from a number of organizations that uh, were either um, using or looking at the use of uh, a subscription to a telephone interpretation service. You know, is that something that people could pool together and make sure that that's just um, something that's more available in the community? Another recommendation is that funders and planning tables should continue to examine the geographic distribution of services and support Cambridge-based organizations to expand supports. Uh, so we heard this um, a number of times in the survey where when we would ask, uh, you know, where would you go for this support or that support? And they would just say, well, it's not available in Cambridge. Um, so that's something that, uh, you know, a number of people um, who or a number of organizations that uh, are based in Cambridge will, will know that there's not necessarily the same geographic distribution of services. Um, and that's something that maybe should be looked at and, and perhaps not even in, in the context of only you know, KW versus Cambridge, but also thinking about the townships as well. Okay, so under the theme of uh, community harm and hate crimes, uh, we uh, heard a lot um, from our participants in the focus group, um, just not really knowing what the first step was um, for after they had experienced a hate incident, um, which I have to say within our focus groups was a widespread common experience that many of them had experienced hate crimes or um, harassment uh, in our community. Um, so we recommend establishing a live reporting number uh, to report hate incidences and being provided with immediate connections for counseling. And so of course, I'm sure many of you have heard of the new service being offered by the coalition. So um, obviously our recommendation, you know, goes hand in hand with that uh, offering. Uh, under employment services, uh, we heard, saw a lot in our survey data, a real need for services and supports for workers um, or applicants who were experiencing workplace discrimination, Islamophobia, sexism, and uh, workplace harassment, and just a real need for affordable services around that issue. Um, so that came up quite strongly in our survey. And then lastly, around financial independence, um, we did, uh, this wasn't a huge concern in our survey. Um, we had we didn't see a huge need in this area, but one idea that did come forward was the, to establish a community trustee where women could hold their money separately and confidential, confidentially, um, generally around areas of family violence, if there could be a place where they could um, start to build a bit of a savings um, safely and independently, that would be helpful. Next slide. So around family harm and domestic violence, um, 
we did hear, uh, we did spend quite a lot of time in the survey as well as in our focus group really focused on the issue of family harm and domestic violence. Um, and these are the recommendations that we've come up with. So again, to partner with a peer support worker program uh, to really have a bridge between these diverse communities and uh, these mainstream services in our community. Another issue that we ran into was just Many people knew that there was a shelter or had heard that there had been a shelter, but had no idea sort of how the shelter in our community is set up. Um, many of them thought that it was sort of set up like a homeless shelter and it wouldn't be a safe place for their children. And so um, one recommendation would be to post photos um, on, their, on the website of what the shelter and their rooms look like, as well as to hold open houses for faith organizations and community leaders, and to also promote, you know, if there is an offering of halal food, if there's a prayer room available, interpretation available. And this is a good recommendation, not just for domestic violence organizations, but any um, community service organizations. Um, the next, again, is to look at um, providing services and support for separated or divorced Muslim women. Uh, that was a group of um, participants who were especially isolated um, from their cultural community and also a mainstream community. And so having sort of special supports uh, for that group is needed. And then uh, there was a lot of discussion in our focus groups around the development of a shelter specifically for Muslim or racialized women um, and there was quite a lot of discussion. I wouldn't say there was consensus on the point, um, but it definitely does deserve uh, further study. So then we also looked at um, uh, employment in the in the sector and um, and this was one of the uh, you know one of those troubling themes that we found um, in in this um, in this report. So if you look at the the, uh, the chart here, the question um, was, and this was, you know, again, a question to service providers, does your organization have Muslim women on staff? And so we had uh, just under 50% that said yes. Um, so, and we talked to a lot of organizations that um, were really focused on uh, being representative in their hiring. Uh, but then when you go to the next question um, and, and the next response, yes, in leadership, um, it's almost universally a no. And so, you know, what you see is, you know, nearly half the organization saying, yes, we have Muslim women um, on staff and, um, and then, you know, very few or almost none saying, um, yes, they're in positions of leadership. Um, and so, and then of course there were a few not applicable if that organization didn't, uh, didn't have staff. Um, so our suggestion to service providers um, were that they need to hire people who are representative of the community. And again, that's that, that that first point, yes, um, we, you know, we saw a lot of organizations, talked to a lot of organizations that, um, that were focused on hiring um, people who are representative of the community. Um, the, the challenge there is then the, the second point to hire Muslim women and other racialized and marginalized people for and promote beyond frontline roles. So what we heard often was um, from both from organizations, but we also heard from many of the, the women themselves, um, where uh, the organization knew that, you know, having um, somebody who was in that uh, frontline position, who was representative of the community, could speak the language of the community that, um, you know, perhaps was, uh, was, was the, the majority community in that area, um, that that was really important. And that made a big difference in, um, in making that service more welcoming and, um, and accessible for people. Um, the challenge that was, was then, you know, do those women who are hired for that, uh, for that role, uh, you know, ever move on in the organization, move up in the organization. Uh, often what we hear from, from um, organizations was, well, you know, they left before, you know, and, and often it was because there, there, didn't, there wasn't that feeling that there was that opportunity for, uh, for promotion, for advancement. Um, and then the, the third piece there, implement equitable hiring policies and invest in their staff members to position them for advancement. So again, not hiring people only with the, the idea that, well, we need somebody who speaks this specific language to work in this neighborhood, um, thinking about that that person, just like any staff might have their you know, ambitions and, and hopes and, uh, and want to develop in their career. Um, this quote that we have here is you know, one of those kind of gut punch quotes that I, that I talked about. Um, she said, I think the reality in our field is that positions are being kept by white women of a certain age. And I, I also note in the report that um, uh, men are, are overrepresented in the nonprofit sector in positions of leadership. 
Um, and it's very hard to break into that. There's still the we know best attitude, someone who is known in the community and lived here for 30 years, that's who positions are going to. A lot of positions are already spoken for, even if they're advertised. And so you can see, you know, there, there is, um, you know, what we were hearing from uh, a number of women who, who had this experience where they'd, um, you know, gotten a job uh, with a certain organization and, you know, that feeling that, okay, I'm, you know, I'm on my way in my career and feeling very stuck in that, uh, in that frontline position. Uh, you know, one, I, I know one person, um, what she said was that uh, basically they, they don't care uh, what my interests, what my career goals are, um, because, you know, she's sort of stuck in that, um, in that one kind of position. So really troubling area. And uh, very connected to that um, was in, in the area of community leadership. Um, so again, if you look at the chart, um, does your organization have Muslim women on your board of directors? Um, we had, I think, two responses that said yes, uh, and I note that those were also organizations that primarily served a population that was made up of Muslim women, uh, and the vast majority said, no, we don't. Um, quite a few were unsure, um, so often, you know, in the interviews there, it, you know, we would sort of say, okay, understand you might not know if there's um, specifically a Muslim woman on your board, can you talk about the diversity on your board, and, and again, almost universally, um, not a lot of diversity uh, on these boards. So our recommendations here to support equitable representation on local boards, the community should um, establish or support a service in the community that links organizations to BIPOC board members and provides guidance and support to organizations on anti-racism, decolonization, equity, and inclusion. Because again, we heard it's not just about, you know, recruiting um, diverse community members. It's also about making sure that those boards are actually you know welcoming inviting places and that they're actually including um voices that they that they want to hear from um and i do believe that um there is a community member that's been working on um a service like this um and and hopefully we see more of that um, establish an ongoing leadership program to support people from marginalized groups or with lived experience with the knowledge encouragement and connections to participate on the local boards so again not just um you know, taking somebody and, and placing them on the board and letting them sink or swim and making sure that they have the, you know, the understanding of, uh, of what it is to be a board member, what goes into it, what their responsibilities are and, and, and things like that. And then the other piece here, and this is connected to this quote, um, where she said, uh, for a lot of newcomers, uh, a board role is just a privilege we don't have. We can't just go and do something and not get paid for it. So again, as people, um, you know, perhaps as, as newcomers, um, you know, working on getting established in the community and, you know, working survival jobs, learning English, you know, the idea of uh, being able to commit, um, you know, their evenings to a board role where they maybe then have to pay for transportation, think about childcare, um, you know, what's the cost of that, uh, the idea of doing that and not getting paid for it is just something that um, it's something that they can't entertain. And so the suggestion here is that funders should consider a fund to support people from marginalized groups or lived experience with resources to participate on local boards. So if, for example, is childcare the barrier, then in that case, you know, is there a fund that we could tap into to make sure that, um, uh, that you know, babysitting is paid for and, uh, and then that person then has the ability to, to go and do that um, and just to make it a more equitable opportunity. So um, in mental health, uh, in our focus groups, we heard quite a bit about the stigma around mental health in the community and how much it prevents people from coming forward and seeking help. Uh, and so our recommendations are that um, organizations, mental health service providers should build stronger partnerships with faith leaders, cultural communities to increase the uptake of support. So making it more culturally acceptable for folks to access supports in the community. To, the other area was around developing partnerships with professionals and organizations in neighboring communities. So like in Toronto, uh, in London, in Mississauga to increase access to counselors with shared language, religion or culture. Cause there was a real fear when we talked about, you know would you prefer to speak to a counselor who spoke your language or who was from your culture? The concern was that some of these communities are quite small. And so there was a fear that you know, the council, they would know the counselor uh, personally from the community. And so being able to make those links 
um, to counselors um, in neighboring communities was really important uh, to distribute information on supports in, uh, in a variety of languages uh, through local high schools. So that's specifically around youth mental health and then creating some kind of a multimedia campaign featuring member, members from uh, ethnic linguistics and religious communities explaining their mental health experiences and resources that are available. So really trying to break down that stigma and uh, make it acceptable to seek help for mental health. Uh, so the next area, it wasn't a specific theme policing, uh, but it did come up um, time and time again in our focus groups. There was a range of feelings and experiences shared, but generally there was uh, pronounced feelings of fear and mistrust related to the police. And this was stemming in some cases from past experiences in their home countries, uh, but also experiences uh, locally here in our community. And so as a start to build uh, strength in relationships, uh, we recommend that the Waterloo Region Police Services should establish a peer navigator program in partnership with community organizations to establish a direct reporting line um, where uh, the police have been dismissive or racist or have exhibited prejudice. Um, to expand efforts to send the police uh, to community events to sit and listen and engage with people and to fund really an, a neutral arm's length engagement process with ethnic, religious and language communities to hear their concerns and ideas for systemic uh, reforms. And I just wanted to highlight um, just these two quotes. Uh, they're quite powerful uh, that came out in our focus group. So the first one, uh, and this was related to, the first one was a discussion about domestic violence. And so police believe two things about Muslim women. They are dumb and they are traumatized. Police are starting their conversations with these ideas in their minds. And then the second one was related to a discussion about whether or not if they had experienced a hate crime, if they would call and report that to the police. And this participant said, I would not report the hate crime to the police because if he wasn't in uniform, the police officer might do the same thing. So uh, the area of policing uh, was probably one of the most troubling aspects of the uh, particular focus group discussions. And it is something that uh, you know, I'm hoping that our report will add to uh, the ongoing uh, calls for action going on in the broader community. For the area of uh, youth, uh, we mostly focus around youth mental health. Um, and so again, we're recommending that information should be distributed through the high schools in a variety of languages so that youth know what services are available um, and that those services are confidential um, and hopefully free. Uh, we also um, are recommending that service providers should work with grassroots, racialized, religio-cultural and ethno-cultural focused organizations to offer gender specific or targeted programs that are more comfortable for female youth and their caregivers. So this was mainly around issues around recreation and after school programming. So that's uh, that's about it for our presentation, and and you know it's really really high level. So uh, you know we really hope that um, you do take the step to download um, the summary or the full report uh, from the CMW website. Um, there's so much content there, and and really you know I mean when you think about um, 600 voices uh, going into this report, um, you know, we really hope that um, that it's welcomed, that it's uh, that it's engaged with, and and that it starts some conversations. Um, next steps you can do, obviously download the report, um, share it with others in your organization, uh, peers from other organizations and anyone else you think you should see it. Uh, find the recommendations relevant to you and your organization or the sector that you work in and begin conversations about what your organization can do. Uh, and then additionally continue the conversation and, and let's invite more people in. There are many voices in our community just waiting to be heard. I think, um, you know, as, as Fazia mentioned, uh, you know, it's quite an unprecedented report to get in, you know, this many voices in this level of detail to be looking at um, access to services and, um, and, you know, what we can 
see is that there, you know, there are a lot of things that people are doing well, people are working really hard, but also there are things that aren't going well. And, and there are significant barriers, um, you know, even as so many, uh, so many of us are focused on removing those barriers, they, they exist and they persist. And, um, and unless we really look at them and, and hear the voices of the people who, um, who are actually um, using services or, or very often not using the services, and, uh, and those are the people that we really need to hear from. You know, there could be um, similar studies from, you know, looking at uh, different populations, um, you know, looking at other racialized or marginalized groups or communities. You know, you wonder what, um, what people, um, you know, who perhaps have a, a disability um, and access services from organizations, what would they say? You know, again, looking really broadly and, and looking at people who aren't using the services as well. Um, or, you know, what would different focus areas look like? Um, so, you know, the, the certain sectors that, uh, that we picked out of this, what would it look like if we looked at access to healthcare for racialized communities, for example? Um, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, there's quite a bit in here when it comes to equitable employment and, and advancement and supporting, um, supporting community leadership, um, studying the role uh, and integration of grassroots, uh, ra racialized, religio-cultural, ethnoculturally focused organizations. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of conversations that, uh, that need to happen. And, uh, and we hope that uh, this is a step in that, in that direction. So that is the, the end of our presentation. And then we're gonna get into um, questions as well, but um, you know, we, we do welcome you to, to get in touch with us um, if you have further questions. And of course, um, the coalition there, there's the website address and that's where you'll be going to download the report um, after our meeting. Wow, thank you so much, Cameron and Lindsay. What a strong quote by Muslim participants in the focus group, as well as from the service organizers. Uh, please feel free to go and read the report. Sarah has posted the link in the chat. I'm going to post it again, but if there, not if, but there must be many questions and we are still okay with the time. So Sarah, to you and Ashigul, please moderate the session for question and answer. And I will also keep an eye. You are welcome to type your questions in the chat. Thank you. Thank you Wonderful, thank you so much. Just a glimpse of the report, we saw that. Thank you, Cameron and Lindsay. And um, whoever would like to ask questions, you can um, raise your hand. Um, and if you are um, to raise your hands, there's a strip at the bottom with the mute and stop video um, um, buttons. And there is one button uh, that is, uh, uh, that is the reaction button. If you click on that, there will be a raise hand feature. Um, if you're not comfortable doing that, you can obviously uh, chat it right on the chat as well. And if you're not comfortable, uh, you can unmute and ask those questions. All right, Karen, yes, please. Well, I just want to uh, thank really the coalition for, for you know taking on the leadership to do this in the community. And of course, um, Cameron and Lindsay for doing the, the report. There's, there's lots to be learned here. Um, and, um, and I'm taking away, I want the group to know I'm taking away, um, you know, some of the pieces on mainstream agencies and, and their, you know, reliance sometimes on the grassroots organizations, we certainly value um, our partnership with grassroots organizations, but I, I agree. I think it's true. We we often expect a lot from you, um, and you know we don't consider um, you know compensation for expertise in ways that that we need to do that. So I I, I just wanted to sort of publicly say that as a, a mainstream agency, um, I do have a question um, about the interpretation services. Um, and maybe it's in the full report, I don't know, but um, just for Cameron or Lindsay, is there a sense um, coming from the community that, um, you know, this telephone um, interpreting services would be, you know, preferential in some ways, uh, you know, is, does it create more anonymity? Does it, um, is it, is it easier to access? I just wondered if those things came out um, you know, through the, the conversations and the surveys, I guess. 
Yeah, thanks for that. And, and you know, I mean, Family Children's Services has, has been supporting, uh, you know, smaller grassroots organizations in, in lots of ways with space and, and all kinds of support. Um, and, and you know, I think it's something that, you know, as a wide, uh, the wider community, uh, you know, needs to look at about how, how do we make sure that these organizations are sustainable because, like, the, the, the importance of the role is, is so clear. Um, on the interpretation, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we didn't really get into... Um, or hear too much from uh, from Muslim women about um, you know whether they preferred one or the other specifically or or generally. I think that uh, one of the things that we would hear um, sometimes from um, from women was again the concern that you know perhaps they're from a small community, uh, you know a small linguistic community, and um, there aren't many people in the community uh, speak that language. So the interpreter who uh, you know might be hired is somebody that they already know or, or knows them in the, and, and well, you know, we, and we interviewed um, uh, the um, multicultural center and, and, um, and you know, talked about their interpretation and they're very clear about, you know, confidentiality. It's, it's extremely regulated. Um, but even, even with that, that doesn't mean that people necessarily feel all the time comfortable in, uh, in, in having somebody else be a part of, you know, your medical appointment your mental health appointment, um, or, you know, your, um, you know, when you're working with a domestic violence organization, right? Um, and so, so in some ways, you know, that telephone interpretation was, was kind of preferable, because um, there is some anonymity in that, you know, they, they, they're perhaps using somebody who lives in GTA, or, you know, another location, um, who has no connection to the community that you, you reside in. So yeah, that's a, you know, whether it's uh, all the time, preferable. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that we, we answer that in the report, but, you know, I mean, definitely it has that, um, that benefit of, of the anonymity. I think there's one thing about uh, this interpretation, whether you get a, you want the decision between getting someone from the community who can also play kind of a sort of an advocate role and kind of do cultural interpretation, not just word by word, interpretation because like you know there are just not language barriers that a lot of time people are facing in those situations there are also cultural barriers not understanding the system but then like you know uh, parallel to that is the challenge of especially for smaller linguistic communities is that if this that person is very close to them everybody knows that person then sometimes people are hesitant to open up completely like you know Although like they understand there would be confidentiality, but it's still it's hard. So it's it's not an easy decision to make. Maybe a choice, maybe asking people whether they would, you know, prefer someone uh, through phone or someone from the community might help. But I, from my experience as well, there is not this way or that way only. It's not exclusive. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the cultural piece is important too, because, you know, when we talk to service providers again, you know, there were, there were a few where, you know, the question, what do you do when you encounter somebody who, who doesn't speak English? Uh, you know, there were some that would say, well, we just opened Google Translate and, you know, I mean, that's how they do it. Right. I mean, and, and again, you know, they don't have funding, they don't have, um, you know, so that's sort of where, you know, the idea of, um, you know, more of a, an, an umbrella, uh, resource when it comes to like the telephone interpretation is that something that's maybe you know doable to make sure that more service providers actually have access to some interpretation you know that's 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 beyond Google Translate for example. Thank you, Daisy. Any other questions? Hi, thank you, thank you for having me here. This was this has been incredibly insightful, and um, uh, thank you for this thorough. Uh, report and meeting. Um, one question I have, two questions I have, one being, is this report meant to be public? Okay. I see a lot of head yes, nodding. Yes, okay, yes, so that's it is public. Nice. Absolutely, yeah. the report is available, full report is available on our website. Okay, perfect. Um, and then a question to the Coalition of Muslim Women, anyone, this is to anyone, is there anything that uh, that you feel is not in the report that you feel you would have added? I think that's a, that is um, 
the question for the research committee. One thing that we noticed um, about halfway through the process was that we didn't add a question about, for example, the educational education credentials. So the report does not have that as part of the demographics. And um, like in terms of if, if we would do it again, what we might not do, I think Lindsay was talking about how financial independence didn't really come across as, you know, um, anything to be uh, concerned about. So maybe we could have added uh, another domain. We were worried about the length of the survey and everything. So we really had to choose between so many, like, you know, very important uh, uh, domains or areas of concern. And we eventually ended up um, uh, doing um, uh, just six of them. So yeah, we might have uh, traded uh, financial independence, you know, for something else more important. So yeah, so there are always like, okay, we could have done it differently. Um, we had we had to we had to find a balance between our desire to know a lot and and people's uh, capacity to. Uh, fill out surveys, right? It's so important. The, the survey that we had on Survey Monkey for people to fill out was quite long. It wasn't like, you know, um, it. we tried to keep it simple, simple languages and stuff like that. But imagine if you have to go through, I think about 10 questions with in every section and there are six sections in total and then there are demographics. So there were quite a lot of questions and uh, so yeah. Yeah, so, uh, but we, we hope, and this is one of the recommendations that there are definitely further studies that can be done um, and not just around the needs of the Muslim women, but using the model to do it for other racialized or, and or marginalized communities, definitely. There is a, you will find a lot of overlap because of the intersectionality, right? Like, for example, if you are black, you're Muslim, you're a woman, and if we can have a needs assessment done for women, and somehow we can make sure that it's an inclusive study, then you can see um, uh, overlaps there. Same thing with black, right? Like, so you will see all of those overlaps if we can, if we're able to conduct these needs assessment, especially around service needs um, in our community and beyond. Thank you. Uh, as a person of color, I could, I could definitely identify with a lot of uh, topics that came up and specifically as it relates to boards. Um, I am still learning and trying to understand boards and in my last neighborhood association meeting, even the question was brought up as to why we continue to uh, use the uh, typical model that a lot of boards use and how we can kind of break that down and create new models. And I really feel like this report and, and the work that everyone is doing has the potential of introducing new models that would become more accessible to people of color. So um, thanks for your comments and, and your answer and uh, for this opportunity to listen and thank you. You're welcome. I just want to point out that we have Capacity Canada in the room. So I'm sure that Kathy is listening to the conversation and there'll be some solutions for our region, hopefully. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Mike, you're next. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me start. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, Fazia, uh, Uzma, Wissam, Isagul, Cameron, and uh, uh, Lindsay for this report. Um, I found it really powerful. Um, definitely will be sharing it. Uh, but my, my question is, it seems to me like the report is an invitation to the community to dig into these 35 recommendations. And so I'm curious, and also I, I'm mindful of the first recommendation being, you know, not to, for mainstream organizations and agencies to do the work and not expect grassroots organizations to do that work. And so I'm curious if you got any thoughts or if others in the room have thoughts as well around um, how to hold the conversations that need to follow this, to follow through on this invitation and maybe how folks in the room could help to advocate to others, uh, to uh, invite others into holding conversations on some of these recommendations. And so just open to any reflections on, on your thoughts to continue the conversation. I think 
I would just say quickly, I think Cameron was also trying to say this, that this is an invitation. The report is for the community. It belongs to the community. It doesn't belong to CMW or racialized, other racialized uh, cultural organizations. It's there, right? It's when it's ours, we have to own it. We have to take it. And uh, these conversations can start anywhere and everywhere. Um, so we hope that those conversations will start and people will take uh, the responsibility to do that. Um, the thing is, it's not that uh, the cultural or racialized groups are um, um, not willing to work. Like, you know, we, we had quite a few cultural uh, organizations, leaders in the focus group as well. They want to go that extra mile and do the work. It's just like, there are not enough resources, not just in terms of financial resources, but also expertise as well, right? Like one person is not expert or one organization is not expert on everything. So just thinking that, okay, this is a coalition of, this is coalition of Muslim women. So they should be able to provide support for anything that Muslim women need. We don't probably have expertise to do that or dollars to do that, resources to do that, right? Kevin, you want to add something? I just wanted to, you know, say in that, in that, you know, and I hope it doesn't come across as uh, being, you know, especially critical of mainstream organizations, because what we were hearing is not that, um, that these organizations have a disinterest in, in engaging with these communities. It's, it's, they're very interested in it. And, and what the challenge is, is that, you know, for a small organization, when you've got 10 different organizations, you know, in all sorts of different sectors, that want your support in, in being that bridge and, and providing some cultural guidance and, and you know, being a part of uh, you know, a service plan and that sort of thing. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's wonderful that these organizations are doing that. The problem is you know, the challenges for these small organizations to be able to sustain that and to respond to all their requests, um, both from the community uh, and, and from all these uh, different organizations. So it's, it's more of a, I think a comment um, that you know, it would be great if it was a bit more coordinated with mainstream organizations actually get together and say, okay, how do we all fit, um, you know, in working with, in working with these groups and how do we make sure that they're, that we're not, you know, overburdening them, but at the same time, making sure that we're inviting them into these conversations and, and inviting them into these, um, into these roles, because, you know, it's a, it's, it's a great thing that's happening. Um, the, you know, the challenge is really, you know, around how do we make sure that, you um, the requests that are coming to them are appropriate, that you know, staff um, from all kinds of different organizations understand what the role is of some of these organizations and what their limitations are um, and how best to engage them. Um, and so I think it's um, you know, it's one of those, it's 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 a good problem that you know that that there's this much engagement. Uh, the challenge now is, you know, how do we make sure that it's sustainable for, for these organizations? And and some of these pieces are happening, right? You know, the um, you know, we've seen a, sh a shift in, in the way that funders are, are engaging. Um, you know, I know that we have the KW Community Foundation here and, um, you know, they introduced their, their BIPOC grant um, last year, which was, you know, a big step where, again, they're, they're specifically um, asking for, um, uh, for some of these organizations to bring forward proposals um, and, and making sure that that funding is going to these organizations. So, you know, is there more of that that we can be doing? Um, so I think it's more of, yeah, that, that's that broader conversation and how do we, how do we coordinate it and, and, and make sure that they're supported. Wonderful. Um, so I'm mindful of the time. Uh, we are almost uh, getting- Sarah, through. we have a question in the chat. I think yeah, we yeah. have comments, I was... questions from the chat, yeah. Okay. Uh, yep. Um, so there is a there are two comments related to translations. Um, so I work uh, Jen from Breastfeeding Buddies of Waterloo Region. Um, um, comments: I work in breastfeeding support. If I can't bring my own translator, who for the record is a volunteer, we do use telephone translation services often. It's easy and convenient, but unfortunately, most translators are men, which doesn't work for bre breastfeeding conversation. Absolutely, that uh, would not be there. Dan uh, from Immigration Partnership uh, uh, is saying it's really great. The research is so valuable with interpretation. It would be amazing to have a community-wide interpretation service. The Lynn has supported something like this for the health se care sector, but it would be so good to have this beyond the health sector. Absolutely, I think uh, there, there is value in that. And then the question, um, it sounds like you covered many immigrant and refugee communities. 
I'm curious why you chose Muslim women as the area of focus rather than immigrant, refugee, racialized. Yes. Who would I can answer that question right? because we're going through this struggle internally as well, right? Um, so definitely the organization was founded by Muslim women for the issues that were very concerning for us. And uh, so people who founded the organization, people you see them engage in the organization are people who also have the lived experience. And there's definitely a layer of being Muslim um, that actually um, that actually made make your experience different from the experience of other racialized um, folks uh, or and or other women. So there's definitely being an, an added layer of challenges and barriers. And I think that was that could have been seen in the quote that was um, on the screen at the beginning of the presentation about being a woman, being an immigrant and being Muslim and being black and being Muslim. So for us as an organization, of course, like, you know, um, uh, we are concerned with um, challenges that uh, Muslim women are facing. We see the racialized communities, like they are part of a, they're, they're kind of subset of the larger group. It's not the subset. Um, everyone who was in our study was also a racialized woman and also like, you know, um, a racialized woman, especially like, you know, so, so that's the thing. And the study itself was open to everyone. So for example, if you go to the questionnaire, it would ask you about faith. And we had a list of different faiths plus like prefer not to say, and a lot of other things. So we did have some uh, responses which were, uh, they chose, uh, who chose uh, uh, as uh, either prefer not to say or other faiths and stuff like that. Uh, but yes, definitely the, 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 the focus uh, population was of Muslim women. And just to remind everyone that Muslim women are over, like, it's almost like one or the other. Muslim women in Canada, like 98%, maybe 99% are racialized minorities and are immigrant, right? So there's this intersection of race, being a racial minority, being a religious minority, and a woman. Wonderful. Thank you, Fazia. A uh, couple of comments. Um, Emily uh, is saying thank you so much for sharing this report. Green Bay Chaplin Community Center in Cambridge is eager to support these conversations and working on these recommendations together. Kathy Brothers saying Kathy and Capacity Canada are first ones to acknowledge the colonial roots of board governance, big changes, uh, big changes coming in reframing governance in partnership with many diverse folks. And Kim is saying, uh, you know, in addition to uh, to this, how to share and coordinate and cooperate in the actions that come forward from these calls for actions, uh, recommendations as citizens, as service agencies. So that's really important, uh, absolutely, Kim, to have that, um, uh, you know, communication. And, um, you know, we are doing this and learning from each other and sharing, um, you know, the best models. Uh, and really uh, do this as a community and not just, you know, uh, high, uh, maybe um, one, one, one organization or uh, something doing it on its own. So that's really important. And um, Bobby Goldenberg is saying Family Counseling Center of Cambridge and North Dumfries. Um, Cambridge Addiction Services is interested in, in examining how we can partner and contribute to services for Muslim women and children in Cambridge and the townships. So these are great comments. Uh, any other burning question? Last baby question. We are at six o'clock. We should be uh, wrapping up, but um, yeah, maybe one last question, if there is any. Okay, all right. So I will uh, uh, wrap up. Sorry, yeah. can I just have some? Yes, I would hate. Mm -hmm. I would hate to lay, leave today and missing someone that I didn't thank from the peer worker. Also, Asli, I forgot to mention Asli Suleiman, who's our peer worker for the Somali community, and Amina, who joined us before. I can't thanks enough uh, Aishigal for all the support she uh, provided us with this um, uh, project from the beginning. She was always there anytime we will text her email, she's responding. And uh, I also want to thank Uzma for all the um, support she gave us and by uh, 
also like wherever we need an operational uh, matter, she's there already. And uh, uh, finally, Fozia, who is our like backbone, or I don't know what to say, like with Fozia, like she's around everything, every time. I don't know how much effort she can put to that. Like it's uh, it's the maximum, and uh, and she keep telling us don't work over the time, <laughs> and she's the, the first one to do that. So I just wanted to thank her from my heart for all the support and, and ideas and um, uh, uh, working tirelessly, uh, connect with funders and, and make our dreams come true in providing the programs to the community. Thank you, Fozia. Thank you, everybody. Ms. Uzma, back to you for clo formal oh, closing. So, uh, Abiha just has uh, her hand. Did I miss your hand before or? Abiha, do you want to ask something? Um, I just want to say that, um, for the Cambridge folks to connect with the Muslim women of Cambridge, I have just I have put the website on the and I'm the co-chair for the Muslim women of Cambridge. So um, I know there was a talk about the disconnect in Cambridge. So um, and I want to just thank for Jamazar and the team. This was amazing. This was everything that I wanted to say and was in this uh, report. So thank you for doing this. This was amazing. Thank you, Beck, the Yuzma. Uh, Abiyal, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to all of the participants who are here. Um, uh, of course, the word thank you is never enough. You had spent like almost two hours sitting with us, listening to what needs to be done from the community perspective, as well as the Muslim community. We as Coalition of Muslim Women are here. If any one of you want to reach and do anything in partnership or seek help, or vice versa, we are here. My, our contact information is in the chat. Most of you know our social uh, pages. We will be sharing the report uh, on the website. It is already there, but we will be sharing the information on the Facebook. So stay in touch once again. Thank you so much, Lindsay and Cameron for doing everything and to all the CMW team. Thank you. If there is anything, please write in the chat. I know some people always call us after the meeting is finished. And if you are all okay, can we have a screenshot to post it on the Facebook? Uh, lots of ladies send me a message. Can we have a screenshot? So I thought to ask you all. I'll take a screenshot. I have to take three because it's the three windows are there with 52 people at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, one, two, three, go. Ready, smile. Done. Thank you. Goodbye, Thank you. Everyone. Have, Have a nice evening. evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Nice Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good Thank night. Coming. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And great presentation. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Great presentation. Oh, yeah, but this was 